Good, af good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to our series of seminars on ethnic studies and teacher education. I want to begin with the land acknowledgement by paying our respect to, for me, um, I'm in the Los Angeles Basin, so um, each of us can pay respect to the peoples in the vicinities where we are um, situated. I want to pay my respect to the Tongan peoples um, who, um, land, whose traditional stolen land I sit in today, um, where I live in Los Angeles. I want to pay homage to the ancestral lands of all Native peoples in our past, present, and emerging. And to my ancestors and the people whose land I sit on, I want to apologize for the damage we've done to Mother Earth and, pay, uh, and pledge to pay better attention of our Earth. I invite you to, um, to pay homage and respect to the um, uh, pe Native peoples whose land you are on this afternoon. During the uh, past few weeks, we have examined several issues as it relates to one, um, the issue of ethnic studies and the preparation of teachers who um, are well-versed in the knowledge, content, and epistemology of ethnic studies. During our first session, we examine um, the need to come to terms with the definition, a uh, clear definition of what we mean by ethnic studies as we begin to fold out ethnic studies in our K-12 schools um, and in our colleges and universities. We also paid uh, attention and homage to the community um, connections that we have in ethnic studies by listening and uh, visiting some community-based projects in ethnic studies, such as Black Lives Matter, uh, the Association of Rasa Educators, um, and others. And we also um, uh, listen to the struggles and promises that our K-12 colleagues are going through as they roll ethnic studies out in their districts by listening last week to some of the collaboratives, um, innovative and inspiring collaboratives that they have um, established in their districts. Today, in our second to the last um, webinar, although I've got to tell you by your insistence and um, suggestions, we will more than likely uh, continue these webinars um, even after our forum today. We have one on um, student activism next week and there are others to come. Having said that, what we uh, intend to do today is begin to look at what else will it take to ensure that California students are provided uh, teachers who are both grounded in ethnic studies um, as a content area, but also as a pedagogical practice. At the present time, there are no certification or credential programs dedicated to preparing teachers in ethnic studies exclusively. The state of California has no credential option for ethnic studies teachers. You normally may uh, accept entrance into a credential program and then teach ethnic studies. The job, however, of preparing undergraduate students has fallen on the few undergraduate uh, ethnic studies faculty who have fought to implement single subject programs in ethnic studies. And we do have one university who will present today who has a cohort model for preparing um, credential students in ethnic studies. The many uh, innovative projects that we begin to see emerging to create undergraduate ethnic studies pathways into teaching, in some instances in our university have been blocked, diverted, or avoided. The presenters this afternoon are among the few who have attempted to design university pathways into the teaching profession focused on ethnic studies. Our presenters this afternoon are Darlene Lee, faculty advisor in the teacher education program at UCLA, who will present on UCLA's innovative model um, to uh, facilitate a cohort of ethnic studies um, experts within uh, the credential area. Uh, Rosa Furumoto, my colleague in Chicano and Chicano Studies at Cal State Northridge, 
who is a professor of Chicano studies and her uh, involvement and research interests are Chicano Latino parent critical consciousness cultural capital, school involvement, family literacy, and others. And she will be talking about a single subject ethnic studies focus, uh, Chicano studies focus that um, Cal State Northridge has. And our final presenter is uh, Nicholas Henning from Cal State University Fullerton. Uh, Nick is a founding board member of the California chapter of the National Education, National Association for Multicultural Education in California. He is the chair of the LA Regional Network and active in the movement for ethnic studies. He will be presenting on ethnic studies pedagogy and some critical questions that we will need to examine as we move forth to our session this afternoon, which will invite your voices into the room so that we can begin to collectively design an advocacy model for advocating for an ethnic studies program from um, district through the university and back into the district. Um, so thank you for being with us. If you have questions, uh, those of you who have been with us before know you hit the question and we will either, um, ask, and if you have a question directed to one of the presenters, if you'll put that in there so we can have them answer it, we will do our best to answer those questions. But as you've seen, some of your questions actually invite future webinars. Um, so feel free to ask those questions. I will now turn it over to uh, Drosa Furumoto from uh, Cal State Northridge Chicano Studies. Drosa? Yeah, thank you, Teresa. So let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and... Uh, get started here. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to everybody who's, uh, who's on the webinar. <clears throat> I'm really happy to be here and, and to uh, just be a part of this really important work. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking about the Cal State Northridge Chicano Studies Department single subject pathway. Um, and in the image over here, you can see one of um, our uh, future teacher candidates working with um, some of the little children in the community, uh, um, you know, just doing some work together. So the purpose of my presentation, um, I'm going to do a very brief theoretical context for why I believe that ethnic studies departments need to be leaders in the movement to prepare K-12 teachers uh, to teach ethnic studies and culturally relevant content. Um, I'll also be describing, a, a pick, uh, providing a little bit of a description of the program that we have at CSUN at Cal State Northridge and the, just the broad contours of it. And then I'm going to provide uh, some information about um, how to design and implement such a program at other sites. So in case you all that are on this webinar might be interested, you know, you'll have a little bit of an idea. And then finally, I'll provide an update on our current work um, on uh, the elementary multiple subjects bilingual program that we're developing. Um, so very briefly, um, because I know that Nick is going to get a lot more into <laughs> theoretical stuff. But I just needed to say that um, these, these things, pieces that I want to talk about are central to our work. So first of all, is critical pedagogy. And, um, and really, when we're talking about critical pedagogy, um, we're, I'm talking about praxis, so both action and reflection. And, uh, and then this idea of looking at students, parents, and community members as people that um, have something important to contribute to uh, not only their education, but the education of our students. Um, and then the other big piece with that is that we are using popular education or constructivist uh, methodologies in our teaching, right? So it's not just uh, a banking model of education. Um, and then finally, in talking about or moving over to decolonizing methodologies, um, this is very central to our work. And what we mean, what I mean by that is that we are uh, taking into account the funds of knowledge of people in our communities, our students, 
and uh, parents and community members. Uh, but also we are looking at their traditional ecological knowledge and their local ecological knowledge. So uh, much of our work is also engaged with, uh, social, with environmental justice. And these pieces are really have become key in our work um, in communities. And then in terms of ethnic studies departments and what our responsibility is here, um, by providing our students with this deep understanding and awareness of people of color, LGBTQ, immigrant, refugee people, uh, providing that, that historical and current social struggles and, and, and the teacher's role in promoting social justice in the classroom and community, that this is very central to why ethnic studies needs to be at the core of this. Um, and then finally, uh, this idea that throughout the work that we do, that we want to have this active engagement um, of our students in communities of color with students, families, and community members. And so what I've shown uh, off to the side is some of um, my, the, teacher, the future teacher candidates, they're planting trees with little children. And then in this one, I don't know if you can see it, but it's a father and a little girl and they built, a, they built a toy, it's a helicopter, but they built it out of found materials. It's a solar powered uh, helicopter. So it's kind of cool. We're doing a lot of fun stuff out there. <laughs> All right, so now um, I'm gonna uh, get into what our program is about. So uh, what we have at CSUN uh, in the Chicano Studies Department is we have a California uh, Commission on CTC, um, the California Commission on Teaching Credentialing. Uh, we have an approved program that prepares undergraduate students to teach. Okay, sorry about that. I'm getting a message that my internet is unstable. So hopefully you can still hear me. Um, so our program prepares undergraduate students to teach uh, social science and history to uh, sixth grade through 12th grade students attending California public schools. So that's what we're approved for. And uh, the program consists of 18 courses or 54 units. Uh, many of these courses overlap with uh, the Chicano studies major and also with general education requirements at CSUN. Uh, and also in this program, once the students have um, completed the program, then they, they're awarded the BA. But the other cool thing is that uh, they do not need to take, so they have a waiver from taking the California subject exam for teachers in history, the CSET. Uh, and as you all well know, for many students of color, uh, a lot of these exams become real barriers, right, to their entry into the teaching profession. And then uh, finally, just so you're clear, once these uh, future teacher candidates finish, they still need to enroll in a credential program and complete their student teaching and other coursework um, so that they have a credential and are able to then go ahead and teach. So this is a very broad, uh, this is the big picture. I won't go through it all, but I wanted you to just to be able to see, you know, all the courses that are in the program. And uh, I wanted to point out to you the domains. So these domains up here match to the California state standards for history, social science. But down here in the right-hand corner, uh, this is something that we added, which is depth and equity and diversity. So that's a unique part of our program. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna move this along here. So um, I wanted to take a bit of time to um, talk to you a little bit about um, uh, the steps to developing a teacher prep program if you, uh, your site is interested in this. So I wanna clarify, I know Teresa said this, but uh, as she pointed out, there are no state approved standards for ethnic studies. So if you're gonna develop a program, you have to uh, work with the existing standards. Um, and then you want to see how much of a match the existing standards are with what your department or your program has in terms of course offerings, right? And then you want to check out what teacher prep programs are already being offered at your campus. Um, are they meeting the needs in your community, in your state? What, what's missing, right? And on our campus, we already, the history department was offering a history social science program uh, a pathway for students, but they only had two um, Africana studies courses in there. So they were not really preparing students 
uh, not only to teach in a diverse society, to, but to even hope to be able to teach ethnic studies. So we believe, or we felt that our program was, uh, was filling a big need. Uh, so what we did in Chicano Studies was we created an option within our BA program that was a pathway for these secondary teachers. And if you're in the CSU, you're going to want to contact the chancellor's office uh, because you want to know about the rules for offering other options within your majors, right? I can't get into it because of lack of time, but you're, you're going to want to find out. Um, and that wasn't so hard to do. That wasn't the most challenging thing we had to do. Um, and then the other thing for you to consider is whether your department will have adequate resources to provide advisement and support um, for your future teacher candidates. You know, for, for example, you want to be uh, ready to alert them when it's time to apply to credential programs. And in our department, uh, we do help them with their applications to credential programs. Uh, so there's just a lot of work that goes around supporting students, right? And then finally, um, this is the, the biggest step over here, and that's when you, um, you visit the, the CTC uh, website to find out, you know, what, uh, they have a lot of really good documents there, but you want to, um, you want to be sure that you, um, your, um, the, the standards that you're addressing are the right ones. They have a lot of documents that help you in the process. Okay. And then, um, this is part two, sorry, this is so long, but obviously this is kind of detailed. Um, in some cases, your program does not need to be approved at the state level and can be approved at the campus level. So you really want to talk to the CTC early to find out, you know, before you do a lot of work, uh, just be sure that you check in on that, right? Um, and then uh, writing up a teacher prep program is very time consuming and it's very tedious because you have all these little standards that you need to address. So having a team, uh, having support, if you can get release time, all of that is a really good idea. And the CTC does charge money to review your applications. So, and they take a long time. They took a year to review ours. And, um, and provide feedback. And you may not be successful the first time. We were not, ours got kicked out the first time and we had to redo everything. But anyway, once you finally get their, their, their feedback and you can address their concerns, then you're ready to, um, you know, to, to start moving ahead so you can start to recruit and to advertise. Um, the last little icon um, that I wanted to talk about is that you wanna be on the lookout for funding. Um, and you know to be able to provide scholarship for stipends for the candidates to help them with books and tuition and then the last thing i want to talk about is that um unfortunately on our campus you know each time we would reach out to the education uh, department we did not get a very good reception they were usually very dismissive of our interest in working with them and you know this is really sad because it's an in, it's an indicator of the deep institutional racism that exists on our campuses, and so we have really had to go it alone in Chicano studies, and everything that we have gotten we have fought for, and so you need to be prepared that you may not have a lot of uh, support from the education folks on your campus. Maybe you'll be lucky. Maybe you will have some support, but you know I'm just being honest and saying that. You still have to be prepared to move ahead and, and you know, continue to struggle, right, with, with what needs to be done. Um, so what I want to talk about now is a, a program, the latest program that um, we are working on in our department. And that um, is we're looking at the need for bilingual teachers in the elementary grades. So I wanted to share very briefly a little bit about that need. So these are, are this is data from the California Department of Education. So right now, um, excuse me, for fall 2018, uh, English learners made up 19% of the total enrollment in California public schools. And the majority of these English learners, 70%, um, are enrolled in the elementary grades, K through six. And then the other really important piece of data to look at is that over 80% of all English learners in the state speak Spanish. So what that says to us is there's this tremendous need. And then along with this piece was, um, 
that uh, in 1998, we had Prop 227, which decimated bilingual education programs, and it led to a decline in bilingual teacher preparation and authorizations. So, um, so now, in, more recently in 2016, Prop 58 essentially repealed Prop 227, and it allows non-English languages to be used in public instruction. So there's this huge demand now, and there's du dual language programs are popping up everywhere. There's this huge demand for bilingual teachers, but there's a shortage. So that's where uh, in Chicano studies at Cal State Northridge, we decided, hey, we need to address this on our on our campus. Uh, they were they were uh, they were only producing four teachers a year that were bilingual teachers. That's like a crime, but we are designing a few of them. <clears throat> and the courses will address the culture, the language, the heritage, and the needs of diverse Latino children, including Mexican indigenous children who speak languages other than English and other than Spanish. So uh, on our faculty, we are blessed to have several uh, specialists on Mexican indigenous populations and they are helping us with um, with this um, with this work, uh, and we're also um, so the students who complete this program they'll still need to enroll in a credential program that offers a bilingual authorization. Um, however, you know we will you know we'll cross that when we get there. But our plan then is to recruit Spanish heritage language speakers into the program strengthen their Spanish language skills with courses such as Spanish for Chicanos, and also offer them, uh, based on the, their exams on literacy and fluency, offer them advanced Spanish grammar and composition. So that's in a nutshell what we're working on now. And uh, starting this fall, we will be taking it through the channels, you know, the, um, our college and then the university. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're kind of ready for a big fight that's going to happen because we know liberal studies will not be excited that we'll compete with them. But, you know, we're going to do this anyway because they're not doing it. And with that, la, um, you know, la, hasta, you know, uh, hasta la victoria. I mean, we're just going to keep fighting. That, that's what we're all about. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Our next presenter is Darlene Lee from UCLA Teacher Education Program. Darlene? Good timing, Rosa, you had two minutes. <laughs> All right, hi everyone. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much for um, having me here and I'm really excited to share the work that we've been doing um, in our program and I see people on the on this webinar who probably could speak really well to what we've been doing also some of our students and stuff so I just really appreciate this opportunity. Um, my name is Darlene Lee. I work at the UCLA Teacher Education Program. I'm the faculty advisor for the um, Ethnic Studies pathway in our program. Um, so first, I wanted to offer the opportunity for a little bit of interaction. These are lots of uh, presentations all in a row. So if you maybe want to like quickly take a picture of this, but um, we're going to use for this presentation menti.com. And um, if you go to that website and you enter this code, um, you can um, answer any, you can answer this question, you can type in anything that's resonating or any questions or comments that you have about my presentation. And I'm gonna share what folks contribute to this um, at the end of the presentation. So I'm gonna give everybody like 10 seconds to get there, sorry, to be quick. All right, so I want to really start by just acknowledging that the program that I'm going to speak about has really been built by so, so many people, including our students and different faculty and graduate students. And, um, and so, you know, even though I'm the one presenting right now, there's just so many people who've been part of this process. And so I just want to make sure to acknowledge that and just honor everyone's participation. Um, and just to say, like, I'm the spokesperson, but not the you know, there's lots of people who have contributed to this. Um, and so um, we've, we've really um, been so fortunate of the people that we've been able to work with. 
Um, so our program, um, it's a two-year program. We really started it, um, uh, it we, it's advocated for much before this, but um, the requirement in LAUSD to, uh, to add ethnic studies as a graduation requirement really was a good catalyst for us um, to start implementing an ethnic studies pathway. And so I'm going to use some quotes from some of our participants along the way. So here's Lydia. These are all pseudonyms from cohort two. Um, and she says, I've always struggled with feeling like I did not belong in my classes and in my schools. And the first time I ever felt myself reflected in what I was learning was in an ethnic studies class. Ethnic studies is crucial to the retention of students and teachers like me, this space and the people in it reminds me of the ongoing struggle and responsibility we have to inherited to resist and dismantle systems of oppression. And um, I just want to contrast that with, um, you know, obviously folks who come into teaching with a background in ethnic studies um, very often are people of color um, and, and sometimes they experience um, teacher education programs as really like systems of whiteness, right? That, um, and so just to contrast this with someone who came prior to our ethnic studies emphasis, I mean, this person the whole quote is quite long, but um, she says, it felt as though the class was dissecting parts of my life, but I didn't really get the chance to speak as an expert or someone who may have lived through harsher realities or experienced inequality. And so something that we really tried to be thoughtful about um, in developing this program is what does it mean to center teacher candidates of color, in particular those who have a background in ethnic studies? Um, and so, you know, some of those um, elements have been to focus on the needs and development and sustainability of teacher candidates of color, especially as they leave us and enter the field of education, um, to understand and name and counter the pervasive and overwhelming presence of whiteness. And then also to work towards deepening our own understandings of and capacity to work toward the dismantling of settler colonialism and anti-blackness, which we understand to undergird the entire system of education. And to recognize that we are part of that system. And so that's really complicated and it creates a lot of tensions for our teacher candidates. Um, secondly, um, sorry. I don't know why I can't advance my slides, but okay. Secondly, to build on the expertise of expertise of teacher candidates with a background in ethnic studies. Um, and so that's um, a couple things. One, to connect, to form connections between university-based ethnic studies and K-12 ethnic studies. We understand that to be really complex since m many of us have training in departments and in um, and in programs that, that, right, like I have a background in Asian American studies, but as a K-12 ethnic studies teacher, really being responsible to teach about all people groups and sort of that relational aspect of ethnic studies. Um, and also to form intentional partnerships with alumni and other experienced teachers in the school district with a background and commitment to ethnic studies, since those are the folks that will be uh, like our mentor teachers or our guiding teachers. Um, and then a third principle as we built this program was to really think about ethnic studies as interdisciplinary and community oriented. So we start with um, a, a cohort that really is um, single subject English and social studies candidates, um, but we have always had the intention of expanding our capacity. Um, it's really um, daunting to think about that, um, but but we just want to like acknowledge that that's something that we're really trying to work towards. And then also really um, efforts to build collaborations across the department, the university, um, the school district and the state and to recognize that like we really just need each other to do this work and that it's not really just about one teacher or one department, but about sort of this collective effort. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we really had to think about is like, how do we define ethnic studies? And um, earlier this was mentioned, right, that oftentimes we define ethnic studies as a content area and like then as a framework or pedagogical approach. And we definitely are doing this. And, and then also trying to think about then what does that mean when we ask teachers who maybe have a background in one particular content area to teach about um, sort of the, the breadth of ethnic studies in K-12 classes, at least in the district that I'm in, LAUSD, the, the ethnic studies course description is very much about um, kind of like a, a more breadth approach. And so that, that becomes difficult. We, we, it's challenging to teach about um, content that maybe we have less expertise in. And so our um, team, the one that I showed earlier, has tried to develop this um, definition of ethnic studies. So we're talking about K through 12 ethnic studies as an interdisciplinary approach that starts with and centers the experiences, voices, mm -hmm. histories, perspectives, and dignity of people of color and marginalized communities, um, engaging in an anti-colonial lens and aims to promote healing and instill critical hope and challenges white supremacy and oppression in an action-oriented and liberatory approach. 
All right, so uh, also I'll say like we really have developed a few uh, additional courses and we've really built that on, of course, like so many other people who've done this work and continue to do this work. So um, in particular, two pieces that we've um, used to frame um, our courses and our approach um, is this piece by Alison Tindiago Cabalas and many, many other awesome scholars um, who talk about what does it mean to engage in an ethnic studies pedagogy, um, to, to focus on access, relevance, and community, and to be culturally responsive and community responsive. And then secondly, uh, the four tenets of ethnic studies pedagogy, which is a piece that Alexia Reyes McGovern and Tracy Lachica Buenavista published in our um, online uh, platform at UCLA, um, which talks about these sort of four tenets. So questioning white supremacist constructions of knowledge, including anti-essentialist representations, engaging in community granted praxis, and developing students' critical hope. And so we've really tried to base our courses and um, our um, and our program around these two pieces. Um, and so just a little timeline, uh, we started this program. So the, the policy to have ethnic studies as a graduation requirement was passed in two, fall of 2014. In fall of 2015, we had the admission of our first cohort of ethnic studies teacher candidates. Um, those people were admitted to UCLA TEP and then they had to apply separately to take the ethnic studies pathway. And at that time, the, our, the cohorts were organized into credential areas. So we had an English, a cohort and a social studies court with an emphasis in ethnic studies. That first cohort advocated a lot to have their own program starting in their second year, because our program is two years. And so at, in 2016 was the creation of a resident year program uh, for, their, uh, for their first year full-time teaching and earning their master's degree. And then in 2017, we transitioned the whole program, Ethnic Studies Pathway, to have an Ethnic Studies cohort. Um, and so we had English and Social Studies candidates in both the Ethnic Studies cohort and the Humanities cohort. And so they were directly admitted into this pathway. This is like a little overview of all of our numbers. <laughs> I don't know if anybody cares about this, but um, we have, we've had, we just admitted our sixth cohort of 20 teacher candidates, but this is sort of how it's gone along the way. Our main criteria have been um, to have an ethnic studies, uh, to, to get into our ethnic studies cohort, you had to meet at least one of these criteria, so not all three, uh, to be a UCLA education minor, to have an undergraduate major or minor or significant relevant coursework in ethnic studies, gender studies, career studies, or a related field. So for example, some people have a major in sociology with an emphasis in race and racism, so that would sort of like count. Um, and then also life experiences or a commitment to ethnic studies. Um, so this is the pathway. This is so much. I'm so sorry to be talking so fast. Uh, but uh, we, in our first year, their credentialing year, our candidates take two enhanced classes uh, at 406B, which is Social Foundations, and then Ed Psych. Um, and then they also, in the winter, they take a course called Ethnic Studies Pedagogy. And then in the spring, we have a speaker series, which is designed to enhance everyone's sort of ethnic studies content to kind of bridge those gaps between the different departments, as I mentioned before. In the summer, they start a class called Ethnic Studies Curriculum Building. And I'll just say that like the, the pedagogy and the curriculum class, we, those are like 100% artificial separations that you cannot separate curriculum and pedagogy, but this is just how it's listed in our, in our course catalog. Um, but they start that class in summer and they finish that actually in fall and winter. Um, and then in the second year, they are teaching full time in an urban school and they're um, developing their master's research project. And so they take this series of resident courses, which are focused on instructional and curricular decision making with and all with an emphasis in ethnic studies. I'm going to just kind of keep going. Sorry. Um, so in the first year or novice year, um, we try in the field, we give them at least one placement of ethnic studies. There's two there are two student teaching placements and so at least one of those is in an ethnic studies class or with a teacher who is teaching with an ethnic studies framework. Uh, we do field support or observations using an ethnic studies protocol and then we try to have all of our classes specifically focus on ethnic studies um, content and frameworks. And then in the second year, um, they do their master's project, their inquiry project um, with research focused on ethnic studies they have a seminar and a curriculum class, and then we do, again, do field support using that, the ethnic studies observation tools. Um, so we uh, kind of organize all of our courses around these four categories or four dimensions of ethnic studies teaching. So pedagogy, uh, curriculum and content, multiple literacies and context, and they all have these courses that are associated with them. 
if I had more time, I would go into that, but I kind of don't. Uh, so just a quick overview of some things we're learning and I really wanted to focus on some of the tensions that we're experiencing. So um, one of the questions that we're really asking is what are the programmatic cultural and pedagogical shifts that need to be made to center the experiences, development and sustainability of teacher candidates of color who are committed to teaching up in cities. So three findings, um, how important it is to explicitly develop their approaches to teaching and learning that are collective and community oriented to value their intersectional identities and support them in applying those in the classroom. And then also preparing our teacher candidates to enact their philosophy outside of the bubble of, of an ethnic studies space, right? As they're asked to defend or legitimize ethnic studies. Um, so it's just the first one. I'm gonna skip some of these, sorry. Uh, some just examples of how we try to build collectivity, um, placing people in the field with alumni and other ethnic studies teachers of color, um, creating opportunities for them to, to share about their experiences and to name and to empathize with their uh, ways that they experience oppression, um, and then uh, developing their commitments and, and their capacity to, to connect with other ethnic studies teachers. Some of the complications and tensions with that, right, is to, to not assume similar experiences and ideology, right? So you can be in an ethnic studies teacher education program, you can have similar coursework experience, and that does not mean that you have the same commitments and ideologies. And that sometimes leads to a sense of disappointment. And so we're really trying to figure out, like, how do we um, navigate that tension? Um, another thing is just how do we create opportunities to build collections? Uh, coalitions and collaboration across identity groups with an understanding of intersectionality. So ethnic studies obviously being super focused on race and racism and white supremacy, but you know, we really want to be addressing all of the different systems of oppression. And then sometimes the cohort can be interpreted or seen as elitist, exclusionary, or as a form of reverse racism. And so we're also trying to figure out how to speak back to that in ways that are productive. Um, all right, so, and then how do they apply their intersectional identities and their pedagogies? Sorry, I'm gonna skip all these. I have like, just like two more minutes. Uh, so having an intentional and set aside time for curriculum planning, um, building, um, assisting them to build curriculum that honors their intersectional identities. These are some examples of the projects that people have um, from our program have created in our curriculum class. Um, sorry, and some of the complications and tensions with that is, um, bridging their unique content knowledge to the more traditional content, um, admitting our own, like my own and all of our faculty lack of capacity in particular dimensions of racial literacies and queer literacies and like how do we develop ourselves um, and navigating the contradictions of bringing our own identities and perspectives in the classroom but still representing the system as educators and, and how challenging that is on an emotional level. Um, the third sort of piece that we're really thinking about um, is really how do we prepare our teacher candidates of color to enact their philosophies outside of the bubble so that they can be sustained in, in schools, right? Um, and so some of those situations, legitimizing ethnic studies and anti-racist work, um, countering deficit notions of students and communities of color, facing microaggressions themselves as teachers of, as teachers of color, um, that sort of emotional labor of educating others on concepts such as cultural appropriation, oppressive language and privilege, um, feeling isolated as, as teachers of color who teach ethnic studies. Very, very often, most of our candidates end up being the only ethnic studies teachers at their schools. And so that sense of isolation, how do we help them to make those connections? And then some of the, um, the complications with that is that sometimes as we try to help people form those connections with other ethnic studies, teachers, it creates that sort of like us them binary in schools and in our own program. And that can cause um, just a lot of tension. Um, feeling that our sometimes our teacher candidates speak to feeling unprepared for the realities of schools and, and we really don't want them to feel that way. And um, and then, one minute. Yes, I'm almost done. And then a disappointment in other teachers of color around their the disparities between their racial literacies and other intersectional literacies. So you might have lots of racial literacy and less literacy around disability or around um, gender. Um, and then the struggle to remain to remain hopeful in that. And so as a teacher ed program, we're really thinking about like how do we do all of this in relation to um, field work placements, field support, induction requirements, coursework, credentialing, um, the sort of those networks, and then the job application process. And so it's been a, a huge journey and we're really like not, um, we're not all there, but we're really working on it. And so I wanted to come back to this 
um, this menti.com that everybody's been contributing to and just let everybody take in what what you've been responding to and yeah just thank you so much for your engagement <laughs> and sorry for being quick but no problem it was really good and, and it's a, a a complex program and full of a lot of good stuff so i understand why it's hard to keep within the 20 minutes um our final speaker is Nick Henning from uh, Fullerton. I'm making an attempt to answer the questions as you go through, but I'll also pose a few questions to our speakers when they um, when we finish um, our last presenter. Um, Nick, you are next. Well, thank you, um, and I, um, Dr. Teresa and uh, Dr. Patricia, I really appreciate you inviting me, um, and especially to invite me to speak um alongside i don't feel alongside but uh, alongside um rosa and darlene um rosa i met a long time ago i believe in the beginning conversations that we had about the california chapter of name i believe that's where it was and darlene and i have known each other for a really long time we were in the same cohort together at ucla tep we were both social studies teachers and darlene lasted in the classroom a lot longer than i did and she's just exceptional and um we work we're presently working on another thing uh, right now in a, in a collaborative and um, it's just amazing uh, because I feel like um, as I sit here and, and I'm, I'm going to talk just for in a second about the work uh, which is much more nascent uh, than the work that uh, Rosa and Darlene just presented about um, it's it's exceptional to hear um, how far this is this has been taken um, you know, Rosa, I really, I, I wish I was at Northridge, right? I love Fullerton, but I wish I was at Northridge to hear about the partnership that isn't there with education. Um, I feel like we're just so ready for that. Um, and, and do know that I'm gonna take this, what that framework that you presented, I'm gonna take that to Fullerton. Um, and, and Darlene to see how UCLA's teacher education program from the days that you and I were there, how that has transformed um, and we have TEP alumni that are uh, that are in the in the in the Q and A the uh, the mentee.com thing already. And it's it's incredible to see. Um, so, in terms of what I wanted to sh to share really quickly, um, on top of being lucky enough to be to be invited to uh, this. Um, I was also in 2013, actually before 2013. Um, Darlene, you mentioned the article. Um, that myself and other much more esteemed co-authors uh, wrote together. But we were, this slide, the next three slides are from the first time that we presented the work officially in a conference setting. Um, from uh, 2013, we presented this at the NAME conference. So all the folks that you see there were part of the presentation. We were presenting toward an ethnic studies pedagogy, implications for K through 12 during the research. And, um, the way that we talked about it in, in this next slide um, was that this paper, which collected all the excellent research on uh, ethnic studies pedagogy and what is effective ethnic studies pedagogy, uh, began from San Francisco Unified School District teachers who had institutionalized ethnic studies for ninth grade. It was actually a pilot that they did with just a few of the high schools. Um, and what they were seeing over two years was just incredible. They were having amazing results anecdotally. They hadn't really looked through the, 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 the data necessarily, um, but they were having district officials coming to them and saying, wow, we're seeing kids who are eighth graders and who, are, who, we, who we have labeled as at risk, red flag kids, whatever term they use. We are seeing them transform by 10th grade and all those indicators of them dropping out and going into these other pipelines, um, those go away. Why is that? And they had no idea the ethnic studies that those kids were taking one course of ethnic studies in ninth grade and their lives were being transformed. So they came to us and said, we want to expand the pilot study, but we want to know, if you look at the next one, questions about the purpose of ethnic studies and how one teaches it emerged as teachers with and without ethnic studies background collaborated. So this idea about what is effective ethnic studies pedagogy, we feel like we know some of the stuff of it, but what kind of research backup can we get? So Alison Tintiango Cubales and Christine Sleeder kind of, she brought it to Christine's attention and then Christine brought it to a group of us 
uh, attention. And we worked as a collective to put this together and, and, and wrote a paper, which is uh, available in the Urban Review if you want to check it out. Um, but the questions were that the major questions were what is ethnic studies pedagogy and what are its implications for hiring and preparing uh, K through 12 teachers? And, and Rosa and Darlene have already done a wonderful job in sort of explaining uh, what those basic principles were that we found in the research. Um, but here it was super interesting for me to look back at that presentation and look at what we were thinking about in terms of implications for practice in teacher education programs. So even though we were talking about what is ethnic studies, what's effective ethnic studies pedagogy, what does it mean to do that? Um, we obviously had to think, okay, well, if we, if now, if we feel like we have a sense of what that might be, how do we then create a pipeline of teachers who are gonna be qualified and interested, and like Darlene said, who have these commitments to ethnic studies and to doing that well K through 12, what might a program look like? So, um, some of the major things, and, and, and I have to note that in, in, in Rosa and Darlene's programs, a lot of these things that I was thinking through are being addressed very directly. Um, I'm sure you all will see that, but the first one being recruit students of color and students majoring in ethnic studies for the teaching profession, right? So we know that we have a population of folks who major in ethnic studies, who are disproportionately folks of color. They are, they are the population we've been looking for, <laughs> you know, since DSEG or not since DSEG, but since 1954, right? This is, this, is, this is the common problem for 50 plus years. Um, but also that we have a pool in ethnic studies who are not seeing a pathway in, necessarily into teaching. Uh, two, this idea of a moratorium on tests that discriminate against prospective teachers. So Rosa, by your development of that program, that uh, SM, uh, SMPP, you guys are really doing that, right? You're, take, you're saying CSETs are now set aside in the state of California, CSETs are set aside, you do these courses, you're gonna be able to, to bypass that. Um, and then the idea of, we had ideas of weaving ethnic studies content into state credentialing tests and teacher programs to kind of just say, well, if we can weave it in for everybody, that might be good. Uh, and then this, this critical self-reflection piece, right, which is, um, you know, I feel like in, in Rosa and Darlene's program, those were really being addressed too. Um, and so if I look at my, the two approaches that we've tried at Cal State Fullerton, which to this point have been ineffective, have um, in terms of an, an approach to create some type of pathway, if not make it part of the secondary education or elementary education programs that we have, um, it has been largely unsuccessful. And we have had dozens of faculty work on this for many, many hours. Uh, only in the case of the first attempt that we had, which was to do a, a certificate pre-credential. So folks that are in an undergrad, a certificate, which was a joint certificate in, I believe we called it cultural linguistically uh, responsive teaching, which was to say, you get a certificate, you, you can take two or three of uh, courses in humanities, social sciences. Almost all those were within the ethnic studies departments that we have. And you take two courses that in education, which also happen to be prereqs for either the elementary program or the multiple subject or the single subject program. If you do that, you get a certificate. So the idea was, was to take folks that were already looking to do a credential maybe in history to say, you can also get this kind of added cachet by getting a certificate and doing more ethnic studies, right? At that point, this is 2013, 14, we started to see um, districts in the state of California begin to implement this kind of high school graduation requirement idea uh, of one course. And so we wanted to be responsive to that. That was kind of the push that we were saying, wow, there's really an opportunity here. Uh, and then on the ethnic studies side to say, what if, what if you tried out a couple education courses? You might not be thinking about teaching, but if you just took a couple courses, you might see that a lot of what we're doing, and we felt pretty confident that a lot of what we were doing in the, in the courses that we were suggesting for them were very much aligned with what ethnic studies um, is about in part. Um, and so that we worked on for about a year, developing that, having multiple meetings. And basically at the end of it, we were told you may not continue this anymore. This is a case of double dipping. It's a case of people getting credit for this, that, and the other. I mean, almost the idea like they might graduate too fast, <laughs> which now is a big initiative and et cetera, et cetera. But 
Um, so you kind of felt like, wow, we did this whole thing, just a certificate, right? Because we don't have anything else, right? We don't have an authorization, like a bilingual authorization that we might be able to give. We don't have these kind of, we had to figure out how do we use the systems and the, and the pathways that we do have to begin to create a pipeline. And then when they get to the teacher credential program, then that's a whole nother ball of wax, right? So Darlene, you really, I mean, just address, both of you have really addressed that just amazing well in, in terms of thinking about your programs as models. Um, but then the second piece that, that we started to work on, and, and I think um, our, our present health crisis um, has basically interrupted this in many ways, but um, we have a wonderful master's in education program in second in our department. Um, we actually developed for one year, one time, and I'm, I'm not sure when we'll do it again. I wish we could, but again, a lot of bureaucratic stuff with it. Uh, we had a wonderful combined master's in credential program in culturally and linguistically sustaining pedagogy. Um, so we were looking at the Aline uh, and uh, Paris stuff as guiding principles. We had this amazing program, produced some amazing teachers. But through that, we figured out that, wow, why don't we take what we learned from that, have a, a new master's where one of the threads that we can create is that the actually ethnic studies pedagogy. So kind of along the lines of what Darlene is talking about and also uh, what Rosa's program does in terms of making sure we have some really solid courses that we can use in our master's program for ethnic studies content and ethnic studies pedagogy. Again, this doesn't result in an ethnic studies teaching credential because we don't have it. But again, this idea of how do we give folks extra cachet? How do we get them to come to the door of a school and say, yes, I'm a social studies credential teacher, but I have this extra training, I have this experience, I've worked with a wonderful ethnic studies teacher and I've learned how to do pedagogy. I've done, I've been supervised maybe in an ethnic studies classroom. So those are the types of things, but um, we really were getting a lot of momentum with that. Uh, and then uh, March happened and that has gone away <laughs> um, for now. And so, uh, you know, I, I think one of the crucial questions, um, I was watching um, the webinar that Division K did today and they had uh, Christine Sleater, Cheryl Matias, Yolanda C. Louise, um, were all on the call. And one of the things that they talked about is feeling like kind of prior to March and prior to this health crisis, that we were kind of having some movement on some really key issues in education. You know, and, and, and I, I really agree with that. I really felt that, you know, um, I've started working with the California Faculty uh, Association, our, our, our union in the, in the CSU for faculty and just feeling like we're moving on issues, moving on issues. And then uh, this happened and it just, I think one of the things that they said is we need to be very careful that the issues that we were having movement on don't get pushed to the side. They were also arguing, and I'm sure a lot of panelists would agree, for a complete reframing of how we were doing education before, <laughs> right? We don't wanna go back to normal. <laughs> we wanna do something different, right? That's always what we've argued for. So the idea being, how can we continue to keep these issues in the forefront? And then how can we, again, do this reinvention um, of education as we know it, so it serves all students well, not just a small segment of students. Um, and so, yeah, so I think I would just leave it with that um, and just know um, I'm just super hopeful uh, seeing what, what has already happened. I'm just so ready to take this back to my campus and I, and I hope that um, we'll hear more examples and then um, also that you feel, feel inspired as well. So thank you. Um, thank you, Nick. Uh, right on time. So we do have um, some questions. I've attempted to answer a few, but I actually would love to pose um, even those to the presenters. So the first one is actually um, for UCLA, and uh, Darlene, I'll let you take that one. And the question is, does UCLA offer resources or classes to new elementary school teachers who have experience credentials and a master's Uh, yeah, I was just typing up a response to that. Oh, there we go. Yeah, but um, so I'm going to just post it up right now. So we actually do have a summer um, institute that will be starting in July uh, for in-service ethnic studies teachers. Um, 
unfortunately, we don't have the application ready just right now, but if you follow our in the UCLA TEP Ethnic Studies Instagram and Facebook pages, you, you'll, you'll see when it comes out. Um, and that's going to be focused on in-service teachers using ethnic studies uh, resources and how that process of creating curriculum. Uh, it's called, the program is called Civil Rights in California and Ethnic Studies Perspective. Um, and so it's, it is California focused. Um, and then our history geography project also offers many workshops uh, that in-service teachers can attend to develop their ethnic studies approach. So I, I was actually looking at the question and I, I would encourage you, Perry, also to pay very close attention to the institutes offered by some of the ethnic studies organizations. Um, Association of Rasa Educators, who we had on last week, um, offers um, a praxis that they do with a, a focus on ethnic studies. Um, and other organizations actually do institutes in ethnic studies. So um, if you, you know, stay connected to us, we'll be able to um, get those out to you um, as they come in. Um, there's also a question um, on how we ground ethnic studies in TEP um, with healing and critical well-being. And my response was grounding ethnic studies actually has to occur way before the um, teacher credentialing program. I think most people would agree with that, is that you do need a strong undergraduate emphasis in ethnic studies. Um, but I'd also like to see if any of the, uh, of, and then I know, and I thought Allison was on, there's um, work being done right now on social emotional well-being in ethnic studies. Um, Allison um, Tinanko Kubalis and Jeff Duncan Andrade are doing some work in that area. Um, so maybe we could later on have something else related to that. I know um, they're working with quite a few school districts on that, but I don't know if anyone, I know Rosa, we do a little bit of it within Chicano Studies. So if we could um, answer that and then Nick and Arlene, um, any enlightening and you could do about um, healing and critical well being in teacher preparation. Carly, what do you think? <laughs> uh, I oh. mean, I, I'm not sure, was Rosa gonna talk first? Yeah. I, I will say something real fast. I wasn't sure. <laughs> We're all like tentative. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that what, you know, uh, I have observed with teacher candidates and work um, in communities is that actually the teacher teach so future teacher candidates they really um, they really embrace working with people in the community and I think for many of them what I observe is that they come into this awareness right of their own ethnicity but also of all the things that all these uh, strengths that the the people in the community have and I think that that is very healing for them. So um, it's just a thought uh, that when we engage our candidates in, um, in community work that's very authentic, and that, that, it, that, the, that, that when they engage in dialogue with people that is authentic, that then that, that, that supports their, their healing and that sense of empowerment for them to go forward as teachers. So actually, Allison is in the uh, queue. Is it possible, Gladys, for her to um, respond to that question with the work that she and Jeff are doing? Yes, Allison, are you on? Yes, yeah, she's on. I'm here. Um, can you all state the question again? Hi, hello, friends. Hello. Um, the question was, how do you um, integrate um, critical healing and well-being into a teacher education program. And so I know you're doing that work within ethnic studies and it would be great if you could um, kind of enlighten folks about the work that you're doing. Yeah, that's the new work that we're, we're doing right now. I'm really thinking about how ethnic studies can provide opportunities for wellness for young people. And I think it's not just ethnic studies, but education in general. Um, and so we really want to push uh, teacher ed programs to really think about what they are teaching teachers to do with regards to providing opportunities for young people to use their identity and develop agency, but also think about how they can continue to be well. And we're really struggling, um, even before the pandemic, um, thinking about how young people um, feel about themselves 
You know, so this is, this is, um, this is not an, a new struggle, but now the pandemic allows us to think about how can we shift the purpose of education to really provide opportunities for young people to become well. And I'm not even talking about teachers becoming well, because I think that that's also very important. All right, thank you. Um, Andre asked, um, how do we bring ethnic studies um, pedagogy into teacher educators first before they are candidates? And how, does e how do we integrate ESP into, ooh, good question, into the um, teacher performance standards in the, at, um, at TPA? So I can answer the undergraduate. It'd be great if other people would answer the other. I, I do think that um, ethnic studies pedagogy can, and, and actually DOSA can answer it. Um, in the sense that that's, that's part of the work that we try to do in be, while they're undergraduates and they major in ethnic studies. So the, the, it used to be thought, you know, well, you can't do pedagogy because the colleges of education are going to do that in the fifth year. And, and we found that actually um, doing ethnic studies pedagogy doesn't have to wait to the fifth year. It can be integrated um, within the undergraduate programs, um, and I think Nick stated it well as well, is that undergraduate majors in ethnic studies going into teaching actually needed earlier. Anybody else want to take a stab at that one? I'm going to just make a quick comment that, um, Amika's, I, I think I heard the person ask about the teacher performance standards, and one of the big areas that is really just huge is this idea that teacher candidates have virtually no opportunities to work with diverse families before they get hit the classroom. And uh, so the research that I've looked at shows that it's very unusual. And of course, the way this translates is that many, many teacher candidates uh, go into teaching with a deficit view uh, of, of people of color and the families and the parents, right? So I think that in terms of, even though the TPEs uh, give lip service that, oh, we're supposed to, you know, honor the family and respect the parents, the candidates have no experience with that. So uh, I think what Teresa said about starting them early in undergraduate programs, engaging with communities, working with families, they, they really become empowered, but they also become enlightened about uh, the strengths in the community so that they don't walk in the classroom door with already having a, a, a negative view towards families. Thank you. Um, uh, there's another question, um, and actually I, this is a really interesting question because um, I'm actually working on trying to make sure that our legislators um, understand that um, uh, Arab and Arab American culture and history is a part of ethnic studies. That's uh, uh, a, a bigger question, Kareen, that one that we've been um, grappling with and educating a lot of people on. But I'm going to ask this question of Darlene because I do believe it's directed towards um, teacher preparation, uh, but an, anyone can answer it. Would, it. would there be any way to include Islam, Islamophobia, Arab and Arab American culture and history into your ethnic studies program? And my response was absolutely it is a part of um, asian pacific island studies it's a part of uh, the model curriculum framework that um, some of us worked on but it is an area where there is a lot of unclarity when you begin to ask folks to define what ethnic studies is so in other programs um darlene is there um can students focus on this when they enroll in the tep program as a content area? Um, I 100% think that talking about Islam and Islamophobia and Arab and Arab American culture is 100% part of ethnic studies. I'm not sure, like, I definitely, I understand that it's, um, it has the umbrella of Asian American studies, but I also just think that it, it probably needs to be its own unit just because um, it's just such an ignored uh, and invisibilized um, aspect of, of our, of our like the, the fabric of the American culture. Um, so, you know, I, and our, our history geography project actually also does have a, um, a summer workshop. I don't know if they have it this summer, but 
has a summer workshop on this topic, but I think it's, it's definitely something that should be taught. I, I'll just go back to, I think it's really hard right now um, to think about ethnic studies at the K-12 level because you are expected to be an expert in all of the different ethnic studies um, content areas. And so you, like an ethnic studies teacher has to, you know, it's, and I think people do this and we're all willing to do this, but it's a lot to expect um, like new teachers to be developing their, their content in all of these areas. And so we really do need to work on how do we support that? How do we make workshops available and resources? Because it's so, it's so hard um, to, to say like, oh, I have this background. I've specifically studied this thing in ethnic studies, but now I'm expected to teach this whole breadth. But I do think it should be expected. We, we should really be working on countering Islamophobia in society. That, that should be like a huge part of our work. Um, and yeah, it is not always, but I think this is where like we need more, um, we need more, you know, PD to be available to people. Absolutely. Um, there's one more question. Let me see if I can find it. A very specific question for Rosa. For the undergraduate bilingual teacher pathway is the CSET, um, um, uh, the, um, the language component needed for the BCLAT waived along with the CSET requirement, or is that in the works? No, the only waiver we have is from the CSET history of social science. So we don't have any other waivers for any other, you know, there's still a lot of tests they have to take, right? So no, there's just the one waiver for the um, CSET history. Right, but, but part of the concentration, Veronica, that we're trying to do with the um, bilingual Chicano studies option for elementary is that we know that the test is often a roadblock. And so many times they don't prepare to the test until they, you know, ready to go into the elementary option. Part of our, um, uh, work is to try to work with them and to strengthen their um, linguistic skills so when they do take the test, they're better prepared. Um, Sylvia asks for a colleague, uh, teachers and undergrad major in ethnic studies has a secondary special ed credential in both English and social studies to, would, to teach ethnic studies would this teacher need to add a general ed credential? Huh, that's an interesting question. So she has a secondary special ed credential, um, but she majored in ethnic studies. She would need um, a general ed credential, right? Yeah, she would, and, and yeah. uh, it depends on what area she would be in, right? So I don't know if it's multiple subject or single subject. For single subject, right, in order to teach ethnic studies, yeah. please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, is you need to have the the, uh, the social science right. uh, credential at this point, and then right. right, it'd be worth analyzing her transcript and and seeing if she has if she was a major maybe maybe she's close to having the SS and the P and P for it. Who knows? And, and in truth, if she's already teaching and there's um, it, it, there there are and this is part of the reason why we're actually having this series of webinars is that. We know as this rolls out within districts, there is no um, there is no universal kind of requirement for those who are going to teach ethnic studies, right? And because there's such a um, weak, for lack of a better way of saying it, interpretation of what actually entails ethnic studies. We're not sure what districts are going to look for when they start opening up ethnic studies courses, either as electives or as requirements, right? They may very well say, if you took, and, and we probably would not support this, but they may very well say, well, okay, you took the cultural diversity class for your credential. Um, you know, you, if you just have the desire to teach ethnic studies, you can. Or hopefully they're going to be a little bit more um, conscious about the fact that teachers need um, a, you know, to be well versed in, in content epistemology and pedagogy and say, no, you need at least an undergraduate major or minor to teach ethnic studies. So there really is no provision at this time. The only thing we, we know is you can major in undergraduate degree in any of the disciplines of ethnic studies and your credential at this point is mainly um, English 
or social studies? So I know that's a long way around your question, um, Sylvia, but that's precisely why we're having this. And I actually would invite you to stay for the forum and begin to raise um, some of your questions um, and some of your concerns there. Usually when there's a question, it means someone has an opinion and an idea. And, and at the forum, we're gonna ask you to share those opinions and idea because the idea is to come up with an advocacy plan that would bring together educators, community folks, higher education faculty to begin to develop this trajectory into, um, into teach teacher education and then into the community that contains elements, that doesn't just contain elements or components um, of solid ethnic studies preparation programs, but is a seamless pathway. And it, it kind of takes us into what our, um, our uh, oh my God, there's another one. Last one and then we're gonna transition. Um, this is the problem we have in our district now. We have ethnic studies classes approved and set up with text. Any social, here you go. Any social science teacher can get an ethnic studies class with no background or knowledge or information. This is why we need training for social studies teachers. Thank you, Veronica. That's precisely why we're having this, um, this um, forum because we know that that's the case. Um, we're gonna bring, well, we have room, we still have four minutes, so. So I think Darlene, um, Teresa, Darlene, did you oh, wanna um, gonna say, any your comment there? Did Darlene type some comment about LAS, uh, LAUSD? Oh, I, I just wanted to just offer a clarification because I think I can't remember exactly what was said, but earlier it was just said that you, you have to have a social studies credential to teach the ethnic studies class, but in and I'm not familiar, yeah, I'm not familiar with all the districts, but in LAUSD, there are courses um, that are um, count as ethnic studies, right? But they're in both departments in English and social studies. And then uh, definitely we have lots of cases where people who have those credentials are being asked to teach those courses and don't necessarily um, feel prepared or are prepared to do that. But it, I just wanted to clarify, it's not just social studies, it's social studies in English and that's, um, just right. to offer that clarification. I'm not sure about the special ed piece, and uh, I'm sure there are people who have more knowledge about that than me. But um, I I wonder about if if you have a special ed credential, are you are you permitted to teach any um, of the other electives to general ed classes? And I kind of I think the answer to that is yes. So it's I'm only if they have a credential in um, in addition to the the other. I think. Um, Allison, you want to just jump in? Um, C, uh, the CSET waivers in um, ethnic studies at San Francisco at Northridge are for. I think that's really important to note that we have these. Um, well, one, Northridge has had it for some time, a CSET waiver that people who have majored in ethnic studies actually can do. Um, I think that Nick talked about it when we wrote our article. That was one of our struggles. It's really, you know, these young teachers of color struggling with a CSET. And so it's really important to know that they have the options of doing a CSET waiver at Northridge. And we just applied for uh, the CSET waiver at San Francisco State. Um, right. We're also in the middle of writing a new application um, for a CSET waiver for multiple subject. Um, and we've we partnered with the Department of History and the College of Education to really try to make this happen because we really need to, it, it's more than diversifying right. the workforce. It, they need to, we need to ethnic studies by the workforce. Um, and so I really want to encourage um, those people out there uh, who have access to students who want to become teachers to have them really think about going into these programs and getting these waivers um, and getting the background in ethnic studies before they, before they go into teacher ed. Right, thank you. And, as, and so far we're the only two, so hopefully there'll be more um, popping up as we, as we move forward. Um, what we're going to do now is, um, oh, great Stockton. Um, what we're gonna do now is, uh, Nick, can you put up your final slide? I think that is a good transition into our next um, session. 
what what we are we're going to close out this particular session and we're going to ask for your patience and putting you into breakout rooms to actually begin to talk about uh, what are the implications for practice but not only that what do we need to do to create an agenda a policy agenda and an advocacy agenda for preparing future educators of ethnic studies um, classes and this is we honestly believe that ethnic studies will be a graduation requirement in the future. Um, we want to be prepared for that. We don't want to see things that um, are happening, as we saw in, in the question and answer, where anyone who has a credential in social studies or English or took a couple of diversity courses will be um, teaching ethnic studies. Uh, nor do we want to wait to the fifth year um, for our students to be um, taking ethnic studies courses. So I think what Nick presented on this last slide actually leads right in to our policy discussion. One is, what do we do to make sure that the students that we are recruiting into the teaching profession, especially as it relates to teach ethnic studies, are actually majoring in ethnic studies. And I, I wanna remind folks that ethnic studies is an umbrella that we're all falling under by virtue of um, legislation and, uh, and circumstance. Ethnic studies is four distinct disciplines, Asian American studies, uh, Latino and Chicano studies, American Indian and Native American studies, and African Africaner or, or Black studies. Each of those disciplines in and of themselves are, are academic disciplines that students can major in. How do we ensure that our students are grounded in those before they go in to a teacher credentialing program? We do that for every other content area, whether it's math or science um, or, um, or English. The second is, how do we make sure that the state and at least our institutions understand that tests can be roadblocks and obstacles for prospective teachers of color? And what do we do in order to address it and to make sure that as we design these pathways, we are able to get waivers and where we're not, we are actually able to help prepare our students to take those exams so they don't become roadblocks like the BCLAT students. It's not only important to have an ethnic studies major, you're not gonna get the necessary pedagogy in ethnic studies or the content area or the practice in teaching ethnic studies in a four year BA program. How do we make sure that colleges of education begin to work with ethnic studies teachers to weave ethnic studies um, into um, into their programs? And how do we make sure that the tests that they're taking to get their teacher credentialing, if they have to take it, uh, include ethnic studies and are not westernized or uh, focused on, like the social studies, focused on uh, American history or world history. And then finally, how do we all begin to engage in critical self-reflection that would include the impact of racism uh, settled colonialism and Eurocentrism on uh, identities of all um, teachers, not just ethnic studies teachers. So I would really, when we, Nick and I didn't talk before this, so um, I really appreciate that he did this. What we're going to, what we've seen over these last um, series of seminars are excellent models of bits and pieces that uh, a holistic approach to ethnic studies should contain. So we've seen great district collaborations. We've seen good, a couple of good pathway programs. We've seen, um, you know, great ethnic studies programs that in, um, infuse ethnic studies, but they're all bits and pieces. So at this point, you can go to Northridge in San Francisco for your undergraduate degree, and then maybe you can go to UCLA to get your credential, right? And then go into a school district like, you know, Fresno or LA to actually teach ethnic studies. But we have no um, pathway um, where we're all connected and working together. What we want to do is begin to develop that agenda. And so 
once we close this session, we're going to invite you back to the Open Policy Forum on the Future of K-12 Ethnic Studies and Teacher Preparation. Um, we will be putting folks into a small, I want to thank our facilitators for volunteering. We're going to be putting folks into a smaller breakout teams to begin to design or discuss possible policy issues that we'll be addressing. And we'll go over that in more detail when we come back. Please, please be patient with us because moving you into breakout sessions with our facilitators may take a little time. Um, anything else, Patricia? No, that's it. We put the meeting ID and the password in the chat so all of you can just easily cut and paste. But yeah, let's start logging off and we'll transition to the next forum. <laughs>